morning, everybody. Um, the topic given for today is uh, the role of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors as a second line in diabetes, uh, especially with a special focus on cardiovascular outcomes. So the topic that we have titled our presentation is Kingpin Gliflozin. We're looking at whether gliflozins can be looked upon as the next kingpin, that is the central piece in a steering wheel mechanism, which drives our fight in cardiovascular disease forwards. So uh, why has cardiovascular disease become an important issue with regards to diabetes control is that we felt a lot of the drugs are contributing adversely to cardiovascular risk profile. In fact, in 2007-2008, there were a couple of trials published, mostly by Nissan, which looked at how rosiglitazone and subsequently there was another new drug which had come in at that point, uh, which was also considered to have an adverse cardiovascular risk profile. And following this, it was mandated by the FDA that every upcoming drug has to go through the pipeline of undergoing cardiovascular testing. The FDA had pre-specified an, uh, an outcome which was MACE, major adverse cardiovascular outcomes, as one of the primary outcomes that need to be looked at in all these studies. But what happened as a result of this was the new drug that came out in the pipeline, which was sg 2 inhibitor, not only showed a great safety profile, but it showed an unprecedented benefit with regards to cardiovascular outcome. And that is when the scientific community woke up and took note of that. And then we arrive at this uh, landmark trial, which is the Empiric Trials Analysis, where we have about 7,000 patients with uh, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes with an A1C of 7 to 9, but they had uh, significantly, because it was a cardiovascular safety trial, they had established cardiovascular disease and they were treated either with empagliflozin or with placebo. And the outcomes in terms of the primary outcome showed a definite improvement in terms of the uh, composite of cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.86 and a confidence interval which was not on either side of unity. Significantly, we also noticed that a great significant improvement was noted in terms of hospitalization to heart failure. Looking at the numbers needed to treat from the Empiric trial in terms of the primary outcome, it was about 61. So following this trial, people actually woke up and started a number of other trials. In fact, there was an ongoing trial at that point called the Canvas Group, which uh, modified the outcomes because it was at this point that the Empiric trials outcome had been published to look at whether CGLT2 inhibitors could be considered not only non-inferior, but also superior to the established drugs that were present in practice for treating type 2 diabetes. So uh, when the results of the Canvas trial was published, we again had a large trial with about 10,000 patients, which were in two groups of the Canvas and the Canvas R trial, the Canvas R more for renal outcomes, where they compared canagliflozin with placebo. Outcomes were similar and results also were comparable to those that we noted from the Empiric trial in terms of both the primary outcomes, which showed a significant improvement in the hazard ratio, hospitalization to heart failure, as well as death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization. Um, now, the latest trial that came out, which was in 2019, of which CMC was actually one of the centers recruiting, is the declared TME trial. The clinical question here was that, do patients who have multiple risk factors but no established atherosclerotic disease also benefit from SGLT2 inhibitors as opposed to the other two trials where it was mostly those who had advanced atherosclerotic disease to begin with. So here we had a, a, a number of patients who, had, who were adult with poorly controlled diabetes with or without established disease, but with multiple risk factors treated with either dapagliflozin or placebo. And uh, again, here we see that in terms of the primary MACE outcome, there was an improvement in the hazard ratio, as well as notably the hospitalization to heart failure. Now, looking at the amount of evidence that was generated, there was a large meta-analysis that was published in the Lancet in 2019 uh, to look at whether there is an improvement in treating patients with this kind of a disease burden, cardiovascular diseases or risk factors that predispose towards cardiovascular disease. And uh, it was a well-conducted, it was the three studies that we included under it are the three that we went through just now, Empiric, Canvas and Declare with a low risk of bias. And it was a fairly well-done meta-analysis of the studies and it also showed that there was a significant improvement in terms of cardiovascular outcome. Now, this table is actually looking at stratification uh, with regard to those who had atherosclerotic disease versus those who had multiple risk factors. So uh, the interesting thing here is that actually the bulk of the benefit is seen in those who already have atherosclerotic disease as opposed to those with multiple risk factors. Um, when we look at heart failure and cardiovascular death related outcome, we see a significant improvement in the hazards ratio as well in terms of heart failure status. 
So the question now becomes, is there a biological plausibility for what kind of effects we are seeing and why is it that such astonishing results are being seen with the SG202 inhibitors? So it actually works in a very simple uh, line of logic where if you reduce the total amount of glucose load on the body, then you would require less metabolic demand on the body. So it works on the principle of glucose in has to be somewhere near glucose out. So if the kidneys are excreting most of the glucose load that is there on the body, then it would be a less of a challenge in order to manage it metabolically. So for a large, this was actually a molecule that was discovered 150 years ago, but unfortunately it was not water soluble at that point. Uh, it was called the fluorazine molecule, isolated from the bark and the leaves of the apple tree. So it was only recently that it was made into a bioavailable form and the way it acts now from what we know is it has multiple mechanisms of action on the kidney. So this is a drawing that shows uh, actually the sites at which the SGAT2 inhibitor bind. If you look at the renal cortex and the renal medulla, the glucose load filtered by the kidney per day is about 180 grams per day. Now of this, most of this gets reabsorbed as we already know by reabsorption mechanism. If there were a way by which we could block the reabsorption mechanism, there would be a lot of glucose wasting happening in the urine which would reduce the amount of calorie burden that the patient is going through. So depending on which part of the nephron to target, if you look at this graph, most of the glucose reabsorption happens in the proximal tubule. So if we could develop a molecule that blocks this reabsorption in the proximal tubule, which is what selective SGAT2 blockade does, we would allow most of the glucose load to pass unabsorbed through the urine. Uh, so I'll just take you through this diagram. In, in diabetes, what happens is we have a high glucose load, which is about 180 grams per day. And then most of it is reabsorbed in the proximal part of the PCT through the SGAT2 with co-transport with sodium, the energy being provided by sodium potassium ATPs and exits through the basolateral membrane through GLUT2. As the remaining glucose, which in a normal individual without SGLT2 blockade is about 3%, reaches the distal parts of the tubule, SGLT1 kicks in and as a result of that, the remaining glucose load is reabsorbed. Now we look at a scenario where SGLT2 has been blocked by this drug, which is also what we see in a rare genetic defect called the familial renal glycosuria model. So most of this does not get filtered. It About 40 to 50% of the glucose that now reaches the distal tubule is now taken up by the SGLT1, which is now upregulated in order to compensate for the blocked SGLT2 so that the amount of glucose that you're wasting per day translates to about 80 grams per day, which is a lot of calories. So the interesting thing here is that this is a mechanism that also protects against hypoglycemic events because whatever, whenever this is, this works in a model of euglycemia and hyperglycemia, when glucose levels go down significantly, SGLT2, SGLT1 still continues to reabsorb the glucose and make sure that the blood glucose levels do not become dangerous low. So the first of the effects that it produces on the body is that it has a calorie deficit which equates to about 50 minutes of brisk walking at 4.5 miles per hour by 70 kg man just by use of the this particular drug. The second is because of the reduced reabsorption of sodium and glucose, there's a lot of natriuresis which reduces the amount of interstitial fluid and reduces the amount of weight gain seen with other diabetic drugs. The third is the interglomerular pressures come down because of a blockade of the afferent arteriole. So as a result of this, the amount of filtered load in the kidney decreases which leads to uh, reduced albuminuria secondary to a tubular glomerular feedback which preserves the health of the nephron. The third is it has, it can work in conjunction with the other significant drug class which uh, has improvement in terms of renal progression in diabetes, which is the RAS blockade drugs, ACE and ARB. So the important thing here is that the SGAT2 acts on the afferent arterial causing its constriction, the, SGO, the RAS blockade acts on the efferent arterial and you use both together, they can have a synergistic effect. Also, there is a caliuretic effect noted with SGAT2 drugs which allows us to continue using ARBs a little longer than we would otherwise be allowed in terms of dose limit hyperkalemia. So the other interesting thing is that um, there is uh, an interesting mechanism that happens with regards to shifting the entire metabolism of glucose towards the peripheries of the cortex and the medulla in terms of in terms of the kidney which is affected by diabetes. These are the areas where we have a lot of hypoxia sensitive structures which are located and shifting the metabolism there accentuates a, a global hypoxia which stimulates HIF1, which HIF2, which actually increases the secretion of erythropoietin, which increases the hematocrit, an outcome that was seen in the empiric trial. And this also possibly contributes to improved global perfusion of the heart of the kidney and improved cardiovascular outcomes. So this is a summary slide which shows 
atherosclerosis in diabetes what happens is we have a very dilated afferent arteriole a lot of dilated fibrotic loops within the glomerulus but after using SGAT2 inhibitors constriction of the afferent arteriole reduces intraglomerular pressures reduces the filtration the albuminuria and restores the physiological state of the kidney so it is also important to note that SGLT1 blockade can be targeted in the intestines as well why that is is that uh, the SGLT1 is the primary player in absorption of glucose from the gut and by blocking it there are two important things that happen the amount of glucose you absorb is less and the extra glucose that reaches the distal parts of the bowel gets converted into short chain fatty acids which are taken up by the FFAR2 receptor causing a sustained GLP1 release which also contributes to the incretin effect which can be seen with SGLT blockade so in terms of the heart how does it help you not only noted that there is an increased glycosuria natriuresis reduction of the circulatory volume it reduces glucotoxicity the plasma volume increases the hematocrit as we discussed as a result of reducing the preload we're bringing and the afterload with SBP reduction we are improving the amount of work that the heart needs to do there are recent studies that shows that arterial stiffness also reduces and there's a host of other molecular level changes that happen with regard to shift in the cardiomyocyte metabolism which also increases the efficiency of the failing heart so um, there are certain certain um, one question which immediately comes up is if most of these effects are mediated through the glycosuria and the natriuresis how are they different from diuretic the few studies which have looked at how they could be different from other diuretic classes one is comparing hct with dapagliflozin this increased erythrocyte mass and reduced hematocrit is something that is noted only with dapagliflozin bumetanide uh, versus dapa has shown there is no depletion of intravascular volume which is seen with most of the loop diuretics which are stronger diuretics most of the volume depletion actually happens from the interstitium this is a diagram that shows that this is an edematous person with his skin subcutaneous tissue in the vessel which a lot of the fluid is actually in the interstitial compartment what SGLT2 does is it is removing the fluid mostly from the interstitial compartment without affecting the intravascular volume as opposed to loop diuretic which depletes the intravascular volume and may predispose to acute renal injury uh, the other two important effects are there's a uricosuric effect that is not seen with other diuretics and there is an improved endothelial function and aortic stiffness indices which have been demonstrated recently bioenergetic shift it increases the oxidation of beta hydroxy uh, fatty acids so what happens is that a more efficient fuel substrate is provided for the heart which improves the ability of the heart in terms of increased inotropicity so this actually provides a model to whatever effects that we have seen so far and it leads us to question on whether SGT2 drugs are actually better than SGT2 block it is better than the existing drugs in the market for cardiovascular profile there are a lot of ongoing trials right now but from the evidence that we have right now it clearly looks like they are the way forward and it may be that that influence are indeed the kingpin of diabetes control and cardiovascular safety thank you Good morning, everyone. Uh, it was really interesting to see uh, Prithvi so elegantly trying to not sound like a medical representative uh, uh, promoting his uh, glyphos in products. <laughs> anyway, I have uh, before me this daunting task of opposing the motion that uh, SGLT2 inhibitor is the ideal second line agent in uh, control of sugars in uh, diabetes mellitus with respect to his cardiovascular outcomes. Or is it that uh, really that daunting? Let's see. So I'll be discussing this topic in uh, uh, four uh, headings. Uh, we'll look at if SGLT2 inhibitors are all that safe, uh, like Prithvi put it. Uh, are we really desperate for a safe second line agent for the treatment of diabetes mellitus type 2 that we are running behind a new agent that has been recently developed? Is the evidence regarding cardiovascular superiority of SGLT2 inhibitors that robust? And do SGLT2 inhibitors really cater for the needs of our population? Coming to the safety of SGLT2 inhibitors, from the time SGLT2 inhibitors were uh, tried in phase 2 and phase 3 clinical trials, there are a number of side effects that were noted, uh, including genital infections, increased risk of amputations, diabetic ketoacidosis, acute kidney injury, uh, side effects with respect to clinical trials, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors increases the incidence of vulvovaginal infections by two times. Uh, the odds ratio has been up to 3.21 to 5.23 with dapagliflozin and canagliflozin in large meta-analysis of uh, cohorts and RCTs. The increased rate uh, of UTAs are also been uh, seen in the observational studies and this has been attributed to the glucosuric effect of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. The very same mechanism that Prithvi seems to claim uh, helps with a lot of cardiovascular 
safety. FDA has in fact issued a warning regarding uh, uh, increased risk of infections with use of HLT inhibitors. The recent uh, uh, light throw off to this aspect was when FDA found that there has been an incidence of 555 fornials gangrenes in the past five years after the licensing of HLT inhibitors uh, as compared to only 19 fornials gangrene that has been described with other oral anti-glycemic agents in the past 35 years. And these, most of these infections were life-threatening. Uh, the risk of amputations, again, the CANVAS trial showed that canagliflozin increases the risk of amputation by two times. And the risk factors for the uh, uh, amputations were established in patients who had established cardiovascular disease. I'm sorry for the spelling mistake there. Uh, established neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, and higher SBI1C. The very same patient population that we would actually like to use SGLT2 inhibitors for. Uh, FDA, again, has issued a warning against this. Uh, this has also been reflected in uh, real-world studies. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis, again, the new entity of the euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which is very difficult to uh, uh, diagnose and manage, has aroused with uh, the use of SGLT2, in SGLT2 inhibitors. In large cohort studies, up to two-fold increase in developing ketoacidosis has been shown with the use of SGLT2, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, again, volume depletion and acute kidney injury. Uh, uh, remember how thiazides are one of the recommended first-line agents for use in hypertension, and we still don't use it in the tropics because of the worry of this very same problem. Problem. Uh, so the same might apply true with SGLT2 inhibitors. Large studies again have shown volume depletion related side effects uh, starting right at the time of initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors as compared to placebo in large cohorts of patients. <laughs> Uh, again, there is some evidence regarding increased risk of bone fractures, either due to increased risk of falls due to uh, the volume depletion and uh, uh, postural hypertension. There is some, uh, again, evidence showing uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors decreases bone density, which again predisposes them to fractures. Uh, this evidence, I would say, is, is still equipos. So uh, from the Empire again, the canvas trials, uh, we know that the number needed to treat for major adverse uh, cardiac events for Empire is around 63, for canagliflozin canagli is around 61, for uh, heart failure related hospitalizations around 77 and 87. But the number needed to harm for genital infections is as low as four in males with uh, uh, empagliflozin. And volume depletion related side effects, the number needed to harm is as low as 38. So uh, is it really worth it? The FDA post-marketing surveillance and black, post, black box warnings has been uh, most with uh, SGLT inhibitors as compared to the other class of antidiabetics. This is right there in the FDA website. In that uh, uh, background, we'll go into the safety of other second-line agents in diabetes and are we really desperate for use of SGLT2 inhibitors? We know that SGLT2 inhibitors are not a great glucose-lowering agents. They decrease HbA1c by 0 0.4 to 0.9% as compared to sulfonylureas, which decrease it by 1 to 2%. And if we are actually using SGLT2 inhibitors, it should be for its cardiovascular safety and not for the glu uh, glucose-lowering effect. We know that uh, safety of other uh, oral antidiabetics are established. Um, even sulfonylureas, large uh, meta-analysis have failed to show any increased cardiovascular uh, mortality or morbidity with use of sulfonylureas. Uh, remember the study Prithvi talked about, the one that showed doziglitazone has adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, this was published in 2007, and this was actually a subgroup analysis of a large uh, meta-analysis that showed this benefit. They banched dapagliflozin. Later, a study that specifically looked at cardiovascular outcomes with uh, dapagliflozin showed no difference in mortality uh, or cardiovascular vascular morbidity. The ban was finally lifted in 2009 by FDA. Uh, later, py pyoglitazone was actually found to be beneficial with respect to cardiovascular outcomes in another, another trial. Uh, but this led to the invent of the cardiovascular outcome trials and uh, FDA mandated that cardiovascular safety assessment has been has to be done for all newer antidiabetic agents. But what we learned from the glitazone experience is that truth is shown only by studies that look at, look at the specific question. If you need to look at cardiovascular safety, you look at cardiovascular safety. But if you want to look at cardiovascular superiority, trials should be designed to look at cardiovascular superiority. And we need uh, some amount of time and we need some amount of real world experience data to uh, prove uh, uh, any um, safety or defect. Right, so with that background, let's look at if the evidence regarding cardiovascular superiority of SCLT2 inhibitors is as robust as Prithvi claims it to be. 
the cardiovascular outcome trials are actually designed to establish the safety of newer anti-diabetic agents and not superiority. Uh, however, these trials have been misused by his pharmas from the beginning of its uh, advent to uh, by overpowering them and uh, to show cardiovascular superiority. So FDA actually says if superiority or non-inferiority with respect to cardiovascular outcomes can be demonstrated with meta-analysis of uh, phase one and phase two trials, then a cardiovascular outcome trial need not be conducted. But since FDA issued this warning, all the new anti-diabetic agents have gone through a cardiovascular outcome trial, whether or not this superiority or non-inferiority has been established with meta-analysis. And this was just pharma companies' uh, gimmick. There are a number of limitations with the structure of cardiovascular outcome trials, uh, starting from lack of generalizability to short timeline to assess any potential benefit or harm, and a placebo control design. And most of these uh, uh, trials use a composite outcome and not a particular individual outcome. So this is done to increase the statistical efficacy, decrease the sample size and cost and time, but that comes with its own uh, defects. So do we have evidence beyond to prove that beyond reasonable doubt SLT inhibitors are uh, beneficial in cardiovascular uh, benefit. Like coming to the MPAREC trial, uh, the apparent uh, serendipity there was uh, th actually designed to sh show, th uh, to prove the primary hypothesis that embagifrosin is non-inferior to uh, placebo with respect to major cardiac uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, they wanted 691 events to prove that, and because they wanted to get these events faster, they uh, they got only sick patient to get uh, enrolled for the study. The sample size was actually calculated for non-inferiority and not superiority. So at the end of the trial, the in inference should have been Drug is proven, uh, the drug is, has a proved non-inferiority to placebo in cardiovascular safety outcome. Not that it showed a trend, I mean, and it probably showed a trend towards benefit. Not that the drug is superior to placebo in cardiovascular outcome. And the, most of the uh, benefit in the composite outcome actually was driven exclusively by a statistically significant lower risk of cardiovascular deaths. However, about 40% of these cardiovascular deaths were actually non-assessable, and they were actually uh, presumed to be cardiovascular deaths. When FDA did a sensitivity analysis excluding these deaths, it actually did not show any significant uh, benefits. And another sensitivity analysis done by FDA, including uh, uh, analysis by including silent MI as a part of the composite outcome, also did not show statistical significance. There are similar similar problems with uh, the CANVAS trial and the declared TIMI trial, which I'll skip because of the lack of time. Uh, but what are the trials also have shown is that uh, the major benefit seems to be in the population who have already established atherosclerotic cardiovascular uh, disease, and there is no benefit in patients with multiple risk factors, whatever the outcome assessed may be. So to conclude, there are severe methodological flaws in these trials. Only high-risk patients uh, were included. The benefit was seen only in patients with established cardiovascular disease. And the major predominant outcome that showed a benefit was hospitalizations for heart failure. What a vague outcome to be. Um, uh, all these trials were uh, funded by pharma companies. Uh, you should take it with caution, and the results are at the best, I would say, hypothesis forming. Uh, so do SGL2 inhibitors cater to the need of our population? The Indian population have uh, more than 50% of them have poor control, more than 50% of already established microvascular disease. Uh, they spend about 50 rupees per day for their diabetic medications. The glucosins are going to double their cost of anti-diabetic medications. Are you going to afford it? Yes, there is biological possibility, but this does not mean anything until we have real world experience. Right, I will go through four, uh, six cases. I want you to say yes or no for two questions. 52 year old, 58 year old male, diabetic for five years, on metformin and lifestyle style methods, SB1C of 8% has no microvascular or macrovascular complications on screening. Do you see such a patient in your regular clinical practice? Yes. Would you give SGLT inhibitors for this patient? No, there is no established cardiovascular disease. You wouldn't want to use it. 58-year-old male diabetic hypertensive on metformin is inhibitors lifestyle method. HbA1c of 8.5%, chronic smoker, cardiovascular risk, history of STEMI in father, cardiovascular risk. However, no established cardiovascular disease. Do you see, see such a patient? You do. Can you prescribe SGL2 to inhibitors for him? You can't because the evidence for use in patients with multiple risk factors is not proven in any of the trials. 82-year-old male, diabetic hypertensive, five years on metformin and calcium channel blockers, MI in the past, rejection fraction 30%, HbA1c 9%. Do you see such a patient? Can you use HLT inhibitors? Actually, no, because the safety, none of these trials have included patients more than 80 years in them, and they are at higher risk of falls. They might just fall down, have a fracture, and come back to you with a deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and dyenia. 
Case number four, six-year-old male diabetic hypertensive, five years of metformin, calcitonin blockers, has diabetic neuropathy, nephropathy, and bilateral proliferative retinopathy, or microvascular complications, has an MA in the past, decision fraction 30%, macrovascular complication. Do you see such a patient? We do. Can you prescribe a CL2 inhibitors? No, because he has neuropathy. He has a higher risk of amputation, uh, as shown by all the uh, trials. FDA has told not to use them in patients with neuropathy. Case number five earns 300 rupees per day, established cardiovascular disease on aspirin atovastatin, not on any beta blockers, not on LASIKs, not on ACE inhibitors. Do you see such a patient? They do. Can you prescribe here? They just won't afford. Might as well just add some diuretics, wait and watch. Case number six, 60 year old Lambani, sorry, Simbani, diabetic hypertensive. <laughs> Um, on metformin, CCBs, no microvascular, microvascular complications, exertional breathlessness, echo short, LV systolic dysfunction, 30%. Affordable for whatever medications you want, but has history of recurrent UTIs. He's on nitrofurantine prophylaxis. Why don't you prescribe the medicine that you have most experience with? He believes in experience. Do you see such a patient? We may not, I mean, in private practice, occasionally we might have educated patients like that. Can you prescribe an SCL2 inhibitor here? There is risk of infections, and we just don't have enough experience with SGLT inhibitors. Last case, 60-year-old uh, Mrs. Uh, Birla, sorry, Sarla, diabetic, uh, hypertensive, 10 years on metformin CCB, triple vessel coronary artery disease, health history dysfunction, 25%, no peripheral artery disease, no macrovascular complications, sorry, microvascular complications, HVMC uncontrolled. He's, she is very educated, willing to take all precautions against infections. She is willing to take all precautions against falls. She is willing to do foot care every day. She is, can afford any medication, she completely trusts in you and uh, your decision-making capability. Can you prescribe an SCLT inhibitor to her? Probably yes. But you are going to tell her that you may need to add on another drug later because the glycemic control may not be that great with SCLT inhibitors. If she takes the drug, she probably will have less chance of getting hospitalized for a heart failure, but it's unclear as to whether she'll have a less chance of a major adverse cardiac event and it's probably not giving her any decreased chance of death. Do you see such a patient in your clinical practice? So I think I should address my case right now. SGLT2 inhibitors are not without harms. We have enough second line agents with established cardiovascular safety in our armamentarium. There are methodological flaws in the clinical trials. Even if the results were to be believed, the benefit is only for a very specific subgroup of population. And it is far from being an ideal second line antidiabetic agent in an average Indian diabetic. We need more real world experience, establishment of safety and efficacy. <laughs> At the best, we right now have a reasonable suspicion or a probable causality for SGL2 inhibitors with respect to cardiovascular outcomes. I would, however, conclude saying that there is consistent trends towards cardiovascular benefits with SGL2 inhibitors. There is a strong biological possibility, but robust evidence is still lacking. There are safety concerns, narrow uh, group of people who might benefit. Cost is ridiculously high. We just need more evidence and time. At this point, we should just be optimistic and keep a watch. Thank you. hot debate and I'm sure there are many questions from the audience. Uh, I might start off the discussion with a question about the reduction in all-cause mortality in the Empire trial. Death is a very definite event and anything that reduces all-cause mortality may be a useful drug. What's your comment about? Uh, so the study was not designed to look at all-cause mortality as a primary outcome. Uh, the primary outcome that the trial was designed was to look at the uh, major adverse cardiovascular event. Um, and yes, there was a significant difference in the secondary outcome of all cause mortality, which was not reflected in any of the subsequent cohort studies or the trials of Canagliflozin and uh, uh, the declared trial. So uh, we do not know if that benefit is there. If it is there, we do not have enough evidence yet to believe that it is there. All-cause mortality. So as Amit said, uh, it was not powered to look at all-cause mortality, but of course, looking at the trends from the real-world data, especially the CVD real trial that has come out, which has been tested across a large selection of the population, large European and Scandinavian cohorts and the US cohort, and the CVD2 also, which has tested a South Asian population also, the trends are towards improvement in terms of heart failure outcomes and death due to cardiovascular causes. So even though we have not strictly demonstrated that there is an improvement in all-cause mortality, and there are studies ongoing to look at that, I'm sure it's just a matter of time before we get that evidence in our hands. So. I think one of the major points that you brought out was the expense of the drug. And uh, 
I didn't hear anybody comment about the new glyphosin that is coming out. Nemo glyphosin. Heard about it? Yeah? Okay. That's roughly one-fourth the cost of EMPA or the other glyphosin. So this is something, if it works as well, might find a place here. And I didn't hear a comment about AAC recommendations about a second-line anti-diabetic drug. Would you like to expand on that? AAC recommendations on what to use after metformin. What do they recommend? So actually, in terms of the second-line drug after metformin, we are expected to classify them with regards to their disease burden, the comorbid disease burden, whether they have advanced atherosclerotic disease, whether they have predominant heart failure. And in these two groups, it is suggested that we adopt either GLP-1 agonists or SGLT-2 inhibitors as a second line. Uh, but of course, in a scenario where they do not have established cardiovascular disease burden, then we are free to choose from a number of other second-line drugs which are already available in the market, depending on whether we weight gain, obesity is a significant problem with this concomitant renal failure or there's any of the other comorbidities which would prevent us from using any of the other drugs specifically. But again, this is also limited by the affordability of the patient and there is uh, a catch there that if they cannot afford it, we probably have to eventually go back to one of the affordable drugs again. Yeah, they're, they're, they're basically widen the second line options to include SGLT2 inhibitors. Am I correct? They widen. Why did they do that? I mean, if you are saying that this is a drug that may not have benefit, why do you include that in the second option after metformin in the management of type 2 diabetes by a professional board? Can you comment about that? So, um, having said that, the, the best data so far do suggest a trend towards improved cardiovascular mortality in the subset of patients who have established cardiovascular disease with SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, with the current evidence, it may be reasonable for a, a guideline recommendation to suggest the use of an SGLT2 inhibitors. However, we know that uh, the, the recommendations regarding use of anti-diabetic agents do keep changing from time to time and we do not know what may come up the next year. Uh, so I, I do not completely disagree with the fact that there is a minor trend towards uh, uh, cardiovascular you know, uh, safety and uh, superiority with SGLT2 inhibitors in a very specific subgroup of patients. I'll just give a broad perspective of this whole thing. Uh, I'd like to highlight the fact that cardiovascular studies were started initially with the I would say glitazone phobia, which was presented by Stephen Nissen, um, who in fact has contributed a lot towards uh, cardiovascular medicine, even in the statin trials in addition. And of course, the whole thing was overtoned three years later when the record study uh, data was reanalyzed and was found to be not true that they did have cardiovascular negativity. So in fact, uh, glitazones are fairly safe to use. In every era, there has always been this parallel play between a new drug coming in and the old drug being seen as a heathen or a pagan or something bad for diabetes. It first actually started with metformin, which was banned by the US for 14 years. And at that time, the insulin analogs came into play. And then we had this with um, <clears throat> the glitazones being knocked out because the GLP-1 analogs were also coming into play. So there's a whole market perspective towards this which has actually driven the growth of drugs. I'm not saying that the, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors are bad as far as cardiovascular events are concerned, but I still think that we know the real truth only about 10 or 15 years from now. Clinical trials are biased. I mean, I've been involved with so many of these clinical trials myself, and there's a clinical trial phenotype for patients. Patients who agree to taking part and who want to take part will take part. And even when you're doing a clinical trial, at times you know which patient, even if it's a double blind controlled study, you know which patient is on the drug because of obvious effects that the patients will report to you. Like for example, weight reduction, et cetera. I have a conflict of interest because I help both of you in your preparations and I also had a slight bias towards what uh, Amit was saying. There was one slide which he didn't show, and that's the Emparec trial, 
this is very peculiar. Can you show that slide? At the end of the study of the Empire X study, you have this upturning of the curve. Can that be projected? There's certain things we don't understand, even if they come in the best of journals, there are really strange things which get published at times. So, I mean, I hold this all with a bit of skepticism. I think there is some truth that there is a benefit from cardiovascular effects. But I think like glitazone, we know the real truth 15 years later. They're not bad drugs. They're quite cheap to use in India. Thank goodness for Super 302 being violated before the patent law became present in India. But just look at that curve at the empire. The placebo suddenly turns up in all areas. I can't explain that. So I think it's up to you to make a decision as to how good or how bad you think the STLT2 inhibitors are. Uh, it was a very interesting debate. Uh, I, I have a f recently this la la last publication in 19, which came up with uh, most, there's no doubt that there's a whole lot of drumbeat about the new drug. And the pharmaceutical companies are out to drive home the point that this is the golden drug. But unfortunately, if you study those pub publications, the, one of the main defects that I see is it's purely pharma controlled. They do not have independent, organized, or independent, separate uh, editorial board and the control. So that is one of the major weakness of the, all these trials. The second is, all of them are placebo as control. We do not have head-to-head -head control to choose what Sushay uh, uh, was asking, which is the optimum drug. If you, and this has become, and people have become aware of it, a New England Journal uh, the editorial board changed because of the influence of the pharmaceutical company. So this, we must be aware of it. And I think it's a good judgment, philosophically saying, don't be the first one to prescribe a new drug, but don't be the last either. I'd like to make a comment as far as um, the issue of, of my, what Dr. Kurin says is true, but I know they are placebo control, but it's standard of care which is given a chance to increase its dosing. So from that perspective, I, we don't have an option. I mean, I think when new drugs come in, there's nobody else who's going to be doing those trials. It's only going to be the owner or the sponsor of the trial who's going to be able to the conduct it. I fully agree with the point that the, the trials were sponsored by the pharma companies and therefore there are problems with that. But we also need to look at the problems that we have with the existing second-line drugs. I think some of the problems that we have is weight gain, patients becoming, you know, in spite of weight gain, they have poor control, okay? Now, this is one of the major problems and challenges in type 2 diabetes. They continue to gain weight and they continue to have poor control with escalation of drugs from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. Now, we do not know yet whether use of this drug early in type 2 diabetes will actually prevent this weight loss and produce stable glycemic control. I think trials are underway. Limited trials are available on this, and they seem to show that over a two-year period, the weight loss is sustained at about 4 to 5 kgs, and the glycemic control also is well maintained as an add-on to metformin. Now, this is information that you must keep in the back of your mind when you are thinking of using the drug. You have to think about the costs of the drug, you have to think about the available information, and you need to look at your own patient, what comorbidity the patient has. Okay, I described the patient with the osteoarthritis, the knee was not able to walk. The guy is able to walk after a 5 kg weight reduction. He has stable glycemic control, and the drug is able to uh, produce that. I would use it in that context. So, you need to actually look at a much wider picture than just cardiovascular. You have to look at the overall patient. Uh, Dr. Sijoy, if you could tell us in your secondary hospital setting you work, do you consider using? You don't really need a footnote after all the doyens have spoken. But then, uh, thank you Amit and Prithvi for that uh, uh, debate. Uh, if you have managed to create a confusion in our minds, you have done your part. Because <laughs> I would be really worried uh, if uh, there is no confusion when we are prescribing a drug like SGLT2 inhibitor. We need to really struggle to write that prescription and you have managed to do that. Congratulations for that.
And uh, uh, regarding the amputations and the fractures, which uh, I, I don't think both of you um, didn't highlight credence, which is the 2019 um, the trial which has come out, that has fairly uh, certainly shown that the amputations are not so great and also that the fractures also were not significantly higher. Glycemic control wise, uh, one meta-analysis has shown that towards the long term um, glycemic control wise, the, they are comparable with the other things. There is uh, probably one more trial, but interestingly, uh, a great trial which is coming up in 2022, uh, which is comparing all the second line drugs, but un uh, interestingly, they have not included SGLT2 in that. That might give us an idea about which is the second best drug uh, to use, uh, but SGLT2 in not, not in one as one of their these things. I look at it this way for most of our patients from a secondary hospital lab, uh, care where most of them cannot afford such a drug. We will always need to discuss with them. Uh, most of them cannot understand if you if your discussions also go beyond a level. So some of the decisions we may have to take ourselves. So if cost is an issue and they are likely to not take some of their other drugs because we have started on SGLT2 inhibitors because generally the trend for people to think is the most costly drug is the most effective one. Stop all the others. If I have only 50 rupees, take only SGLT2 inhibitors. That I would be very worried about. I, it's maybe a crude analogy, but I, I look at it this way. If you want to go to cut party, you can go in a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler. The number needed to travel in a four-wheeler to avoid accidents, mortality, would not be very high. But you cannot advise a four-wheeler for everybody because of that. Definitely the mortality would be lower. Of course, uh, reaching there is another issue with all the four-wheelers on the road. But then similarly, any drug with where the health equity and cost is an issue, this is why ADA, which is coming from a very individualistic society background, will look at one individual and say, this drug is good for this patient. We don't consider anything else. But if you look at the WHO 2018 guidelines, they would mention this as a health equity issue, and they give the second line drug still as sulfonylurea. Yes. So that is where probably many of our, uh, especially if you're practicing in a rural area, I would consider that as a major concern for me. Thank you, sir. And thank well you to spoken, the- Well spoken, Sujoy, because I think even the NEAT guidelines, which are UK based, don't place the STLT2 and UK is a more socialist country than the US. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very lively debate. From